Okay, we're going to pick up in Romans 5, because that Sully interrupted me. <laughs> he Sully said that. No, no. <laughs> All right, but in Romans 5, when we're talking about this uh, breastplate of righteousness and what it really comes to, and watch what Paul says here. Therefore, and what he's done is he's just proved that, that justification is by faith, and he used Abraham to prove it. But he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How could you have peace with God if justification were by any other means? If it was by your works, what would happen to your peace as soon as you had a bad work? It's gone. If it was by your holiness, what would happen the first time you did something? You see what I mean? If it was by any other means, we couldn't have peace, could we? Now look what he says in the next verse. By whom? By Christ also... We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You have access to the grace of God? Someone said, well, you're saved by grace. You don't need grace anymore. Folks, we're constantly in need of the grace of God. His grace is the old timers would call it. But I mean, do we constantly need the supply of God? Y'all know we can't have anything without it. And how is it that you're able to go to Him and ask for it and expect it? By Christ. I go there because of Christ. We go to Him and say, Lord, my Savior died for me. And, I mean, how could God turn you away? His own righteousness demands that He do it, doesn't it? So then uh, this is the kind of peace that we can have. Now, if our standing or if our relationship is based on anything else, we're in trouble, aren't we? Y'all go to Luke 15. It's always good to find a practical application of a doctrine and an actual example. And there's a great one here, Luke 15, verse 11. You know, when, when you say Christianity, probably half the people think, well, that's, that's works. He does these good works, and he, this is the kind of guy he is, or whatever. Another half, or another, I shouldn't say another half, like Yogi Berra. You remember Yogi Berra said baseball is 99% mental and the other half is something like that. <laughs> but another large percentage of people would think, well, yes, you're saved by doing something, or in other words, walk the aisle, some act of faith, and then you've got to keep. But there's all these different ideas. But the fact of the matter is we're justified by faith. We're kept by faith. We're, we're restored by where everything's by faith. So whenever we're dealing with this story here and someone says, well, what is this Christianity, this thing? Well, justification by faith literally means it's my relationship to God. I mean, what would y'all say Christianity is? Is it not how a child of the devil has been restored to being a child of God? Well, as a child, do you have a right to expect your parents, as a young child now, right? Don't you have a right to expect food and shelter? They'll arrest you if you don't, won't they? You know, does that child only expect to have a roof over their head when they're perfectly obedient? No. Folks, that child, I'm amazed. The more I learn what's in, it's amazing. I mean, they can do the most rotten thing and in the next breath turn around and ask you for something. Okay, not know no kids can. And at first you're amazed by it, but then you know what? You say, no, that's the way it ought to be. That child is dependent upon the father-son relationship, the mother-daughter relationship, aren't they? Well, what is Christianity? Jesus Christ, by faith, has placed me back in a right relationship to God. And that's what I've got to think about. Now watch this in uh, 1511. Jesus is speaking, He said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them, now in this particular case, keep these sons by, by natural creation, right? Don't make it uh, born again. It's just a natural thing. He had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. In other words, give me my inheritance. It's mine. I'm your son. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And they are wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, has God from your birth supplied you with everything you needed? We give credit to other people, but folks, God does it. Alright? Have you uh, starved? 
Have you died of thirst? Have you gone homeless with no roof over your head and, and the elements <coughs> killed you? God's taking care of us, hasn't He? And why has God done this? Well, because He's God and He makes it rain on the just and the unjust. He's the Creator. He's the Father of the creation. But it says, When He had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and He began to be in war. Now, back to the thing about has God done all these things. Has God supplied all your need? What did you do with all your need most of your life? What did you do with the things God supplied you? Did you use them to the glory of God? No, most of it we squandered and wasted away, didn't we? Now he says, When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in war. He lacked. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. His first instinct is how to take care of himself. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now can you think of a worse thing a Jewish man would have to do than feed pigs? That would be the worst, wouldn't it? He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now, has this man, has the father done anything to this son? No. He's always done right by him, hasn't he? But has the son wronged the father and been disrespectful? He has. Well, watch what he says verse 17. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish without hunger? He's out there in that field about to starve, and he said, You know something? This is crazy. My father's servants are treated better than I'm treated here. It says, I will arise and go to my Father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Is this son going to go back to the Father's house? What's he depending on? Does he deserve it? Has he earned it? Has he got anything he can claim that's uh, given him this right? There's only one word he keeps using, isn't it? Father. What's he depending on? His relationship. He knows even in that condition is this still his father. Folks, this man is going back to this house based on the relationship. He arose and came to his father. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. In other words, the father knew he was coming before he came. And he had compassion on him, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. Alright, is the father vengeful towards him? Is the father in any way telling him, well, now you've done such and such, you've got to pay the price? No. What's the father telling him? He's forgiven. Now watch what he does, though. Remember, he had a plan. He's going to acknowledge all his sins, right? And then he had a solution. I know I can't be your son anymore. Make me your servant. That was his solution, wasn't it? It says in verse 21, The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But, now the but is important. The father interrupts him. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put the, uh, a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. You know, I can see this son coming home and he's practicing. Alright, I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me your servant. I've, I've sinned again. He's rehearsing his whole thing, right? Y'all remember, I'm going to get your story straight before you go back when you've done something. And he walks in and the dad lets him say, I've sinned against heaven. Notice what comes first. He sinned against God, hadn't he? He said, I'm no worthy to be called your son. But does he let him come up with his own solution? He stops him right there, doesn't he? Stop. Did he acknowledge what he had done? And what does the father say to him? Bring him forth. Put the best robe on him. Now, in, in this particular case, putting a robe on him pictures righteousness. But what about the ring? What did that ring signify in, in Bible days? Yeah, it's royalty for sure. It's authority. He, in other words, what they would do is they had a signet ring, right? Hey, you still see this in some of the old Henry VIII movies and whatnot. But they took clay, Henry VIII would use wax, but in Bible times, Job refers to the seal of clay. They would write a letter or put whatever, you know, today we get something notarized and they put that stamp in it. Well, they would seal it with clay and then they would put the ring in the clay. It's like power of attorney. Did he just make him ruler of his house? 
Now, why did he make this son ruler of his house? Watch the next son. Uh, verse 20, well, let's read what he says. He said, bring hither, verse 23, the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry. He has a feast for it. For, here's why, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Are we all born dead in sin? Every time someone gets saved, literally, what's just happened to them? They've been born again from the dead. Born again. Now it says, his elder son was in the field and came, elder representing the firstborn, and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said unto him, Thy brother is come, thy father have killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. He was angry and would not go in. Notice he doesn't get to go in the house. He's near it, don't get to go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. He answered, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Now what's the difference between these two boys? In the yeah, one of them knows what he is and has acknowledged it, hasn't he? What's the other one think? Oh, I've never done anything wrong. Why is the second one going to make a better ruler of the house? Which one's going to be more... Uh, which one's going to treat the, his father's possessions with more respect? The second one. He's been out there without, hasn't he? Which one's going to appreciate his father more? The second one. Which one's going to show more mercy and grace unto others? The second one. I mean, which one is in a position to be a good steward of the house? The second. Now, people ask all the time, why did God let Adam do what he did? Why did he let the devil do what he did? Did God have a plan before the foundation of the world? Did Adam do something that God didn't know? Did God have to go to plan B? Did God allow Adam to fall? And what does the Bible tell us was the purpose? So God could reveal His glory in redeeming Him, bringing Him back into His house, and now what's He got? He's got a creature that has acknowledged what it is to be without God, and now is in the presence of God. And what kind of steward will He make? He'll worship and adore and glorify His Savior forever, won't He? Do you think your first thought when you look at the Lord in heaven will be, hey, there's the one that walked on the water. Hey, he's the one that turned the loaves and the fed five. Man, it won't be what we think, will it? What will be your first thought if you're saved when you look on the Savior? There's the one that suffered and died to keep me from going to hell. Ain't that what we'll think forever? Therefore, those that are around the throne in the book of Revelation, what do we see them doing? Praising, worshiping, and glorifying Him. Did God know what He was doing? And you know, in that same manner I could have said, don't y'all reckon there's a chance that this father knew that this young man, let's make him an 18 year old. Don't you think there's a chance he knew what he was going to do with his inheritance? I mean, come on, you give an 18 year old a handful of money and send him out? But did he do it? Well, did it turn out, even though there were some hard times and a lot of hard learned lessons, did it turn out to be for his own benefit? Was it even for the father's benefit? Even for that brother too, because this fellow showed that he was decent. He, he treated his brother better than that's right it's even better brother. for the older brother and all the older brother can do is judge him and be mad now why is that older brother mad because this one has been chosen why did Cain kill Abel Abel was chosen Abel's sacrifice was accepted Jesus Christ said since I chose you out of this world the world will hate you won't they it's why the older brother hated him it's, it, nothing ever changes all right, let's go look at another example. Go to Hebrews 4. All right, we, we look at our relationship with God and the accuser comes and tries to get us to doubt it. I, I, I use the example of when we pray all the time. That's a, a good example, but it's not the only time. It's all the time he'll try and cause us to doubt these things. The devil comes in and he says, well, now you're a sinner and God's holy and righteous and you've done this or you've not done that. And here he comes to accuse us. We'll watch Hebrews 4.14. Now here's how we can answer the devil. And by the way, never argue with the devil. Where do you get your example in Scripture for how to deal with the devil? How about in Matthew 4 when Jesus was tempted? There's the devil tempting him, didn't he? You know the temptation's the exact same. What's the first words he said to Jesus? 
if thou be the Son of God. You get on your knees to pray, and what's he trying to get you to doubt? That you're a child of God. He tries to break off the relationship. See, he knows you're in this relationship if you're saved. So the only thing he can do is get you to doubt it. And you'll remove yourself from it. You know, that, that prodigal son could have said on the way home, he could have stopped and said, this is all foolish. There's no way he's going to let me back in that house. It's impossible. But he didn't do that, did he? He depended on the relationship. Now in Hebrews 4.14, here's how you can answer it. When he said, when the devil said to Jesus, if thou be the Son of God, turn these bread or these stones into bread, what was Jesus' reply? It is written. Didn't it? Each time Satan tempted him, what was the, uh, the Lord's response? Scripture. He pulled out the sword of Scripture. Now watch, here's how we can do it. The devil says, you can't come to God in prayer. You're a sinner. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That means don't doubt it. Don't turn from it. Hang on to it. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Can you as a child of God go boldly to the throne? Now how can you do that? By works? Great. By grace. By faith. You see, I can't get there on my own works. I can't stay there on my own works. I can't even believe I'm there by my own works. I can't, I can't wake up in the morning and think I have access to God any other way than in the breastplate of righteousness. I'm a child of God because of Jesus Christ. And no matter what, that relationship doesn't change. Now, there's another way we can do it. All right? Satan comes and, and he does this. And basically what these verses say, you say to Satan, yes, you're absolutely right. I know these things about myself, and, and I know you're right, but I never intended to go to God's throne in my own righteousness. Neither do I intend to get there by my own holiness or my own integrity. I don't even trust my obedience. I'm relying solely upon my relationship due to the position of and the work of my Savior. <clears throat> Ain't that how we can go to God's throne all the time? Alright, another example. Go to Hebrews 10. Satan will come to us about some past sin. And boy, he'll bring it up and he'll lay it out in front of you. Now, you know, we've got to discern the spirits, John says, whether they be of God or not. All right? Are there false spirits in the world? Yes. But does the Holy Spirit also deal with the child of God? You know, sometimes your past sins will come up and you... It, you I, I, this with me, at all, like many times it's late at night. And I've come to where I really... It, it's crazy as sounds. I really uh, treasure this when it happens. It'll come late at night. I wake up, I can't sleep, and I start thinking... I'll try and pray, and as I'm praying, I get tired and my mind kind of wanders, and all of a sudden it's like a stark reality hits me, and some past sin will come up. And it's not that it begins to say, oh, what are you doing? Get away from God. It's just the opposite. I'll look at that sin, and then I'll think, oh my goodness, the grace of God. He's, I mean, imagine I'm, I'm a child of God and think of it, and I see the horror of it. And, and you find out it's not even the real horrible ones. It's those ones that we used to reckon to just be nothing. You look at them now and you think, see, that's the Spirit dealing with you. He'll bring up past sins, but He'll do it in a method of sanctification. Satan will bring it up and accuse you and say you're not a child of God. So when he does that, what do we do? Well, here's another way we can answer the devil. Hebrews 10.19 Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promise. Now there's the breastplate of righteousness, isn't it? You know, you, it's like you could say to the devil when he accuses, well, yeah, you're right again. 
this past offense. You're absolutely right. I did it. It's horrible and I hate it. But I'm washed in the blood of Christ. Now, if we can just keep doing this over and over, this is how we stand in the breastplate. Quit looking at ourselves and look at Christ. Now, to get back to this thing about being in the, in the family and in the righteousness. When the devil comes to us with some past sin, or even some past disobedience, or some past anything, right? The first thing we've got to ask ourselves is, okay, when did this happen? Right? When did I do this thing? Right? Generally speaking, it'll be something you, you did before you were saved. It you know, bothers us the most, it seems, at first. Later on, it'll be things you've done since you were saved that bother you the worst. And they start coming on stronger and stronger. So then he'll begin to say, now hold on a minute. You claim you were saved this day. And you did all these things before, and that's alright, I'll grant you that you did those, but now you claim you were saved, and you did these things after you were saved? Now hold on a minute. Are you really going to tell me that you were born again? Where's the change? Satan will say, are you really going to tell me that this is a new creature? Well, what do you have to do at that point? Y'all know there are people today that depend on a feeling they had one day. Or they depend on some religious ceremony that performed one day. For me, for a long time, it was I walked the aisle, right? Well, Satan would come at me with this and I would be immediately torn apart. There's nothing I could do with it. He was right. He'd say, oh, walk the aisle, did you? That's your day of salvation? Well, well, well. On Friday before that Sunday, you did this, and on Monday there you were doing it again. And immediately you're defeated, aren't you? Because you're trusting something you've done. So then how do you answer this question about this? You say, stop. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. The devil will answer, yes, but are you a new creature? What makes you think you're in Christ having done these things? Well, the answer to that is stop. I was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Christ knew me. I didn't choose Christ. Christ chose me. If it would be that I had to be something for Him to choose me, and I'm not that, or I've not been that, then you're right. I wouldn't be a child of God. But I'm not a child of God because I chose Him. I'm a child of God because He chose me. He knew me before the foundation of the world. And had He not known me and called me, I'd still be walking in the way of Cain and be perfectly fine with it. And the very fact that Satan, that you're even attacking me about this proves something to me. That fact that I'm under attack proves that I'm in the battle and I'm on the other team, doesn't it? I mean, you know when you come under attack by the devil, what does that tell you? Jesus Christ said, no man, if Satan attacks Satan, that, that won't work, will it? But what, who is Satan attacking? The children of God. So these things ought to be a form of assurance to us. Alright, let's go look at another. 1 John 3. I just wanted to do this today hoping that we're going to be done with the breastplate of righteousness, but hoping that before we move on to the next piece of armor, we got a practical, uh, some practical application of how to do this, how to put on the armor of God. This is how you do it. Alright, here's another way. Alright? Satan comes, he condemns me. My conscience condemns me. My heart's got me. I'm in trouble. Well, in John, he says, 1 John 3, verse uh, 19, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. And He goes on from there. But if our heart condemn us, then have we conf or condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Now how can my heart not condemn me if I'm dependent upon my conscience and my works and my morals? I mean, literally, if my heart uh, condemns me not, something's wrong, isn't it? But how can I not be condemned? Is there not two hearts here? Don't you have the natural heart we had by birth? Folks, that heart condemns us, doesn't it? That's what the Scripture calls the old man. Well, what am I told about the old man? He's got to die. He's got to die. 
Now, Satan comes along and says, hold on a minute. New heart? I still see this, this, and this. Yeah, you still see the remnant like that, that river I told y'all that started pure and started flowing down and picking up all them infirmities. It hit the valley and then it started going up the next hill. And on the way up that hill, this stuff's falling out of it. It's getting on clear and clear. It's heading for pure, right? So Satan comes along and points out the remnants of this old past. I see this, 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 and this. And your heart condemns you. Well, if your heart condemns you, what heart are you, are you trusting? Natural. You're trusting your natural heart. Well, what's the answer to that? You say, yes, but Ezekiel 36 says that if I'll believe, God will give me a new heart. Mm -hmm. And what did he say that heart is? Righteous. Now, does that mean that I have a righteous heart? Or does it mean I've been joined unto the one that has the righteous heart? Mm -hmm. Joined unto him. And again, it's put in, in the Bible in so many different ways. One of the best examples is a marriage. Joined unto Christ. Alright? If there was a... Okay, Lonnie had a family reunion not long ago. La Palma family re reunion, right Lonnie? If only the La Palmas could get in there. I mean, you've got to be a La Palma to get in the door. Right? And I want to get in there. There's a feast going on in there, and it's the best thing going, and I want in there, but I'm not a La Palma. I go to the door, and I show them my ID, and what do they say? <laughs> no, sorry. No mix allowed. Get out of here. <laughs> this is a day go gathering, right? <laughs> so they, they run me off. Well, I stand back, and I think, now how am I going to get in there? And I come, and I say, you know, I work. I tell you what, let me pay. No, this is for the La Palma family. Y'all know there's only two ways that I can get in there? Now, if I could somehow marry Lonnie, then I'd have a right to get in there, wouldn't I? Lonnie don't want to marry me. That ain't marriage. That, that's impossible. But if I were a woman, it would be possible, wouldn't it? If I married Lonnie as a woman, what would I get that day we got married? A new name. And now what happens? I go into the house. You know, when I walk in there and people would say, who's this? How'd you get in here? You don't belong in here. Grab her by the short hairs and let's throw her out. And I'd say, stop. Lonnie, I'm, I'm with Lonnie. What would they say? Welcome. Welcome. You see, I got in there by marriage, right? Alright, if I can't get in there by marriage, there's one other way. Adopt. If Lonnie would adopt me. What are the two main examples that are used of our salvation in the Scripture? Marriage and adoption. You adopt a child. What's the child get? New name. New house. Oh, see, I mean, new inheritance. What about the woman? What's the woman get? New name. New house. New inheritance. New everything. See, it's a change of relationship. Both, both instances. Change of relationship, right? So then when people talk about Christianity, don't think about being a Christian as being... This is what I do now. I used to do this and now I do that. that. That's putting the cart before the horse. It'd be like that woman I said, are you Lonnie's wife? She said, I must be. I fixed him breakfast this morning. That won't make you his wife. You see, that fixing breakfast is a byproduct of being in a new relationship, isn't it? What would be the correct answer to, are you Lonnie's kid? The correct answer is produce your paperwork, isn't it? Produce your ID. Say, is that really your child? Did you really adopt this child? Hold on, let me get the paperwork and I'll show you. Someone says, are you truly a child of God? Do you have any paperwork to prove it? What do you got right there in front of you? You've got the Bible. Do you have some promises from God? Let me show you all a wonderful one. John 5.24 is one of my favorites. I find I have to tell myself this all the time, and I find myself telling the devil this all the time. In John 5, 24, Jesus speaking says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word. Notice it's not heard my word. As so many people say, Well, I heard this 20 years ago, and that day I got saved. And yes, I got that taken care of that day, and then I went right back to worldly business. That's not what it says. He that heareth, present tense, my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death 
unto life. Is that a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you claim that promise? If you believe, you can. I mean, folks, what, what better could you have to stand on than that? Hey, I want to read y'all uh, an old hymn. I find more and more I like using these old hymns because, you know, anytime there's revival in the church, the Spirit also... Men get said about women too, writing writing songs about what's going on, and you know these old hymns are great. Not this new <coughs> stuff, folks. This new stuff, beware of it. It's just glorifying the individual singing. Um, but watch with this. This is written by Augustus Top Lady. Y'all you know, all heard of him? He wrote Rock of Ages. All right, now he says this is called a debtor to mercy. This is all the same idea. A debtor to mercy alone of covenant mercy I sing. I come with your righteousness on, my humble offering to bring. In other words, I'm bringing my offering to God based on His mercy. All right? How do we go to God in prayer? That's called a spiritual offering, isn't it? In His mercy. He says, The judgments of your holy law with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. Isn't that a wonderful way he put that? Did Jesus Christ come to uh, destroy the law or to fulfill it? Mm -hmm. Did God require that the law be kept? Mm -hmm. You know, He did keep that law perfectly, didn't He? Is that not put to your account? There are people today that have a fit because I say that the keeping of the law is put to my account. Well, what does the law show? Guilt or righteousness? Mm -hmm. Well, how do you know Jesus Christ was righteous? He kept the law perfectly. Is His righteousness put to your account? Folks, the keeping of the law has been put to my account. That law can't hold anything against me. It's just like that lady. You can no longer hold Lonnie's new wife's last name against her. Her old, I don't care, we, even if she was a mick like me and so, you can't hold it against her. She goes into that place. Now next he says, The work which your goodness began, the arm of your strength will complete. Your promise is yes and amen and never was forfeited yet. You see what this person's doing? Or do they have any reliance on themselves? None. He says, The future or things that are now, no power below or above, can make your purpose forego or sever my soul from your love. That sounds like Romans 8, doesn't amen, it? Yeah. What can separate us from the love of God? Last verse he says, my name from the palms of your hands, eternity will not erase. You know that Isaiah said that the believer, God has the believer's name engraven on his palms. He, me and Mexico, every time I read that verse, it, I go to a class and there's an old fellow that comes, and he's got about six or eight women's name on his arm. <laughs> it, it, I tell y'all, for all folks getting all these tattoos today, y'all ought to come see this old man. They gonna look, you're going to look ridiculous in a few years. This fella's all wrinkled and they're all blurry and they just they look ridiculous. He's covered in them, Whitney Lexi. He's got a name and a line tattooed through it. A name and a line tattooed through it. All the way down there, Whitney Lexi. On the other arm, he's got WKRG. I asked him if he worked there. He said, No. I said, oh, okay. I thought, you know, I, why would you tattoo us? But anyway. Will God ever strike a name through your strike a line through that name? You see, if God ever struck a line through your name, this is why eternal security is so important. There are people today, and and you'll hear the phrase, once saved, always saved. Do you believe once saved, always saved? Well, my answer to that is yes and no. Yes, I believe that the person that's truly saved is eternally secure and will always be saved. But no, I do not believe in this thing that people teach today that if you just open your mouth and profess that you believe, that's it, you're saved and you're always saved. Folks, that's false evangelism. Uh, look, I'll tell you all again, Billy Graham did a lot of harm with that come forward stuff. The truth of the matter is, James said, you want to tell me about your faith? He said, I'll show you my faith by my works. He wasn't saying he was saved by his works. He said, well, you want to know what's the manner of my faith? We'll watch it and see. And this is what he's talking about. Now he says again, My name from the palm of your hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on your heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end will endure until I bow down at your throne. 
forever and always secure, a debtor to mercy alone. He, I don't know how to even cover this subject any better than that hymn. I mean, that's wonderful, isn't it? Let me show you all a verse that really just sums it up. Go to Philippians 1. By the way, Tim sent me this. I am so thankful for this. Tim sent me this old hymn book. Some old reformed hymn book he got somewhere. And it is just full. It's got all those old songs that you can't find anymore. And by the way, you'll find out a lot of the old wonderful songs, they're changing them. Have you all noticed that? He, I heard not long ago, a couple years ago, I heard people singing at the cross. And they were singing at the cross, at the cross. They were in a nursing home singing. And they sang at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and burden of my heart rolled away. And they said, would he devote that sacred head for such a sinner as I? And I thought, huh? That's not what it says. It says, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Well, why would they want to change it to sinner? That's less offensive, isn't it? You find a lot of these hymns are changing like that. Many of them. Alright? <clears throat> In Philippians 1, this verse really does put it all together. He says, verse 6, being confident. Now folks, that's a form of faith. Faith is not just a mental assent to some facts. Faith enters in and faith is something that's a substance. Faith is not just, yes, I agree, that's true. Faith enters in and begins to move a person. It, it has assurance. It has confidence. It acts. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, who's the confidence in that verse in? Christ. Now, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, all right, you started off, and now I've got it. Isn't that what most evangelism is teaching today? Mm -hmm. That God, if you will just do this, then God will save you. That says, He which begun a good work in you. Begun? Well, what's the starting point then? You or Christ? It's Christ. Folks, when did Christ begin this work? Before the foundation of the world. He's the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Did He know your name? Is your name written in His book if you're saved? Well, think about what He's doing then. Is He not down here collecting the Lord's jewels? Is He going to leave a single one behind? He said, I'm here to seek and save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And people make that dispensation to be that nation. No. It's the Israel of God. And what does Paul say? There's two Israels. There's that physical Israel, and there's some of them that are the Israel of God. He said, but no. If you're a child of faith, you're a child of Abraham. He said, we are the circumcision, the Israel which worship God in the Spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. So it's like I could say this. The Lord Jesus Christ saved me. He alone called me. I didn't go looking for Him. Folks, when He first started calling me, when I first heard the Gospel, I ran the other way. I wanted nothing to do with it. Getting saved, when I heard that and found out what it was, I thought, well, that'll mean I can't have no more fun. Y'all know people say things like that all the time. He, a fella told me not too long ago, well, I believe it. I'm going to get saved when I'm older. You see what I mean? Does that sound like somebody that's under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? But when the Lord finally called and saved, He will keep you saved until the day of Christ. Well, you say, can a man lose his salvation? I, I've come up with a conclusion. You say, will a man live? Will a Christian lose his salvation? It's impossible. A Christian won't lose his salvation. Right. Can a Christian lose it? Well, no. Will a Christian? It's impossible. That's right. Now, what confuses the subject is the professing Christian. Yeah, hypothetical. Yeah. The Bible shows us that there's always an imitation, a counterfeit. Folks, there are a lot of people that believe what they profess and they mean well and all, but they're going to find out at that day that they were never saved to begin with. It looks like they could lose their salvation in the book of Hebrews, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying he tests faith and he'll show you what was never faith to begin with. All right? If Jesus Christ saved you here, later to have to give you up here, then what would that suggest? He's not God. He didn't know. He made a mistake. He couldn't keep you saved. 
See, the thing you're going to have to ask yourself is not whether or not you can stay saved. It's examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Or is there a counterfeit faith? And folks, it's a dangerous thing. And I tell y'all, I say it all the time. One of the one of the things that'll be the brightest to you if you can be one of these folks that said, "Well, no, I got saved on that day, and I've never had any doubts. I know, I know that, I know that, I know." Y'all hear that sort of thing? You mean you've never had any doubts? You've never had the uh, the devil come at you and get you into stuff? Well, you sure don't sound like the people in the Bible, do you? Someone says, "Well, you can't find people in the Bible that wondered." Have you ever read the Book of Psalms? <laughs> Did the man after God's own heart have some horrible times when he was cast into a deep mire? And Yeah. Folks, that's under the attack. Mm -hmm. And remember the armor of God says we must stand in the armor of God, the whole armor of God. And why? Because the enemy is so powerful. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I mean, I've used this example before, but look, if... Uh, if Mike Tyson come in here, can you imagine Sully jumping up and saying, I got it. I got him, Troy, don't worry about it. What would y'all say to that? I mean, come on. <laughs> Somebody get the stretcher for Sully, right? I'm using Mike Tyson. I know he's an old man now, but you get the point. See, that would be a, a rash statement of self-confidence by a man that had no reason to be confident in that circle. I don't mean anything against Sully, but you would say that just is not logical, is it? Well, what is it for a man that's stouting, oh, I've got this faith, and he touts this incredible faith that he had because I walked the aisle. I prayed through at the altar. A fellow told me one time about his salvation. He was saved because he got a new Hummer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, these things sound ridiculous, but this is the sort of thing that's being taught. Folks, if you don't think people believe that, you ain't heard these TV preachers. What's the woman's name? She got the permanent smile like the Joker. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, Her, Joyce Meyer, yeah. yeah. And the uh, Olsteins. And listen to them. Listen to what they're preaching. Are they preaching that a bunch of worms like us need a Savior? Or are they preaching God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous? Mm -hmm. And what's always the means to this healthy, wealthy life? Give them money. Hank Williams Jr. said it best. They tell you to send your money to the Lord, but they give you their address, don't they? See, that's a bunch of foolishness. It's the same thing that Job's friends preach to him. If you were really of God, you wouldn't be going through these adversities. You'd be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. This proves you're not a child of God, and it proved just the opposite. Why was Job under attack? Because he was a child of God. Now, this is what we can expect. The Lord said, you're going to have these things. So if you can say that your salvation is unwavering and you've never had it, then something's wrong. Now, does that mean you'll always have these thoughts? No. Faith is get built up. But you read. I mean, read what's it? You read some of the greatest saints that have ever lived were plagued by these things. Some of them on their deathbed were plagued by it. I know men that will say, see, they never were saved. You better really check your doctrine. Examine it. Okay, the thing we've got to ask ourselves today is, do I even have the breastplate of righteousness available to me? Or is this all just a joke? Am I kidding myself? Because if I, we think we've ever done anything to deserve being saved, or ever done anything to save ourselves, or anything to keep ourselves saved, that's not salvation. That's an imitation. And we're told there's a false gospel out there, isn't there? And remember what the Bible says. Christ is the way. But there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. That fellow that told me about the Hummer, I've told y'all this many times. I said, are you saved? And he said, yeah. And he went into this 15-minute story about how he got approved for a loan on a Hummer. Right? Now, folks, a Hummer is an expensive vehicle, I'm sure. And after going through all of that, basically what he showed, he said to me, was this. See, God loves me so much that he got that loan pushed through for me. Does that sound like a blessing from God? Based on that, every, every guy in the NFL, the NBA, every, everybody, folks, literally everybody in our country is saved based on that logic. It, you say, well, no, not, it's not a Hummer. Well, you can go to the local little car lots and get approved anywhere now. Pay as you go, they call it. Hey, the point is what that guy was telling me was that that Hummer was a blessing from God, right? And that that blessing was proof. Is, a, is that how it works? Who's the God of this world? 
Satan, can he bless you with this world's goods? By the way, I asked the man what the payment was. <laughs> and I don't forgot, it was way up there. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like a blessing to me. That sounds like a curse. Doesn't it? I mean, can you imagine that rolling around? You Satan mean, love to put you in a home. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And you mean to tell me it's a blessing from God and you still got payments? Mm -hmm. You see? And you ain't even checked any insurance yet or gas, you know. But the point being is that's the kind of foolishness that people hear and they buy into it. Why? Because there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. And what's the end of it? Death and destruction. Okay, any questions? Well, even the ones that say about the false doctrine of uh, that he can lose your salvation or whatever, don't, they don't ever tell you the full verse or the, you know, as the chapter says in Hebrews, it's impossible yeah. to renew you again. Yeah. If that, you know, if you shall follow it, if that's possible, you can't, but they always go back and say, well, I got saved again. It's impossible. Your own know, doctrine, it's, it's false because you can't do that. No, nope. it's absolutely impossible. Yeah. All he's showing them in that verse is, look, God pours out the rain on this field. Some weeds pop up and some good crop exactly. comes up. He picks the good crop and the other's gone. That's all he's showing. Alright, well thank you all very much.